this panel, as I began, it's called the future of Marikana, and the future of Marikana itself is quite an open-ended title, and I think we deliberately wanted it to be open-ended. There's been a lot of reflection today, some beautiful reflection today about how do we build an alternative politics, how do we build an alternative imaginary, how do we think about what must rise rather than what must fall, how do we think about change in this country in a way that is permanent, in a way that goes past the moment, in a way that goes past what is short-lived. And so the purpose of this panel is, is really to try and think as open-endedly as possible about what the legacy of Marikana is, what it can be, how can we go beyond it, beyond it in a way that still retains, remembers, holds in mind, but in a way that at the same time tries to build a country where we no longer have to mourn the killing of union activists, we no longer have to mourn the political assassinations of movement leaders. An Abatlali comrade was gunned down in their house in Cato Manor this morning. So this is something that is very much with us as we speak, as we are reflecting, as we are gathered here today. And so as we continue to reflect and as we approach the conclusion of this day, I want us all to start thinking about what are we gonna do after this meeting ends? There's been a lot of discussions in the middle of the panels and also outside when we're having tea and coffee about the perennial question, what is to be done? Do we need a party? Or must we think of something that is, goes beyond the party form? How do we organize? How do we galvanize? And so that is really what we are going to try and do collectively today in our panel. And luckily, we are joined by two fabulous speakers who are gonna help provoke some of these reflections. A third is going to be joining us soon. I'm here with Nomzamo Zondo, Ronnie Casarels, and Makanya Spipamandla is on his way. Hopefully he can join us in time. To tell you a little bit about them, Nomzamo Zondo is an attorney and the executive director of the Socioeconomic Rights Institute of South Africa. Nomzamo works mainly on housing rights cases, defending communities threatened with eviction, and litigating for the provision of basic services and the upgrading of informal settlements. And of course, we all know her as one of the lead attorneys representing the families of Marikana. Ronnie Kazrul is a South African politician, Marxist revolutionary guerrilla, and military commander. He served as a government minister under presidents Nelson Mandela and Thabo Mbeki. And we know Ronnie for much else as well. And Makanyas Pamandla, who's going to be joining us in a minute, is a socialist, a revolutionary, a leader, and a former miner at Anglo Platinum Amplatz, which is now Sebanye in South Africa. Like at Marikana, Amplatz miners, including Makanya, created their own democratic worker committees. He was a leader of one of the longest strikes in South African mining history in 2014, which included over 70,000 workers, and that was under the banner of AMCU. So hopefully Makanya is able to join us. We will appreciate his insights. So much like the other panels, each speaker is going to have 10 minutes to make their interventions, after which I will ask them some follow-up questions and we, as an audience and group gathered here today, will engage together. So, Mzamo, over to you. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yes. <sighs> okay. So, firstly, I'm going to start at how it feels to be in this moment. To stand 10 years after Marikan. And as someone who's worked with the Marikana families for over nine years, I've always been someone who's very despondent about how much progress we've made. But in the last few weeks, I felt that I actually needed to count all of the victories. Um, and so when I was thinking about what I'm gonna say today, I settled on 10 years of resistance because I wanted to reflect how far we've come to be in this moment. So when uh, Rihad Amku, Jim Nichols, um, pushed Seri to act for the families, at that time, we went house to house, we went to 26 houses in the Eastern Cape. We went, in fact, 29 houses in the Eastern Cape. And then we went to seven houses, five, four in Lesotho, one in Swaziland, one in Sasolberg, and one in Sklachule in the Northwest. So I arrive, all of that work is done. I arrive in February 2013. 
and I arrive at a time where Seri already has 36 clients. And I'm told that our job as Seri is to make sure that every South African remembers the minors who died, who they were, but they remember each of these families. But I don't want to talk about the work that Seri is, and I want to talk about these families. So when I meet them, they are still in mourning in February 2013, we're all in Rustenburg. And when I meet them, they're also at that time still building their own unity. Uh, amongst the issues that were there, I remember, there were issues about the fact that some of them are part of, are part of the, are, come from a part of the Eastern Cape uh, that is disregarded. So when we, when we discuss amongst ourselves, there's issues of, oh, Vele, you're not going to listen to me because I'm from this place. But a few months pass, um, and we have in the group widows, we have a few mothers, some fathers, some uncles, and then siblings in this group. And all of them are quite clear on what they want, which I'm happy with. We get to July 2000, to June 2013. At the time, the miners were pulling out of the commission. They were pulling us out because they're not being funded to participate in the commission. As the family's lawyers, we said, Asia, um, as your lawyers, the best thing we can do is support the miners in their litigation. The families had their own meeting on the side, and then they call us during lunchtime, and they tell us we are leaving this commission. I'm like, huh? Uh, they're saying if the miners can't be enabled to participate, we can't participate. The miners are the only living people who can tell us what happened in Marikana. None of us were there. And of course, as lawyers, we try and reason with them about what, what is the cost of leaving the commission. At that time, they are being accommodated and fed by the Department of Justice. So if they leave the commission, it means they must all go back, be scattered again across these 36 different locations. But they say, we don't care. That's what we're doing. And I get one of the few important lessons in my life about solidarity. Because at that time, the families, I think, were funded. They, had, they were funded by Legal Aid South Africa, by the way. They had lawyers. They had the support of the DOJ. But they said, if the minors can't, be, can't have the severity some support, we're not interested. And while we are doing this, we are worried about what's happening in their different homes because there's no income. So at, at times we're engaging DSD to make sure that they receive what is called the Social Relief of Distress Grant, which is a food parcel now, um, that they get a food parcel. And we get called into meetings and they, and they tell us that we are concerned. We get three meals a day here, but our kids don't have food. Where we come from, there's nothing that goes in the fire. And they tell us that we want you to go negotiate with Lonmen to employ each of us as a replacement of the loved ones who were killed. And my, in, in the team then were two attorneys, a guy who's now an advocate, a guy who's We had the support of Nadira, Kuselwa in the internal city team and Jim. And then there, was, there were advocates. But in the in this internal Seri team, we were opposed to the families going to work in Marikan. We were opposed not just because of the massacre and what it meant. We were opposed because we knew there's GPV in the mines. We knew that there's risk of rape for the widows who would eventually, in the end, go and work in the shafts. And so we, we keep delaying this instruction. And then we, we discover there's a, a letter that's been sent to Lonwin anyway, that is written in Corsa. And this letter says, si le mindeni, ya sole ke loayo, besi tume aba melibetu, kwa aba melibetu, aba tatin tuin, which means our lawyers are poor. So they were like, we're slow because we're poor, we don't have enough resources. And they write to Lonwin, and Lonwin takes months to consider this request. And then it comes back and says it will, it will, it will re-employ 33 of the 36 families that we represent. It will, not, it will not give employment 
to the family of the one miner that was outsourced working for shaft sinkers, sinkers. That's what um, Shaira was speaking about earlier. Not reemploy. It will not give positions to two other families. One of them uh, was at that time volunteering alone. I don't understand that term, but I'm sure America never understands what it means. But he'd been dismissed a year before. The other was was looking for work in Maragan. And when that happens during that time, the families again are consistent uh, about what they will give to make sure there's justice. So they, 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 are, they are here in Joburg. The two years ends, and in fact, it's, it's in November 2014 when the commission stops sitting that they actually get offered these 34, 33 or 34 jobs. And then we are, we are fighting for the other three families and we are trying to resolve that. The commission ends and then there's a new story. The report comes. When the report comes, again, we, we, we meet at vets to talk about the report. They are clearly devastated because in that report, you don't see them at all. You can go look. You won't see any reference, open reference, to the families in the report. Apart from the word families, which appears multiple times, but not them as human beings. They are devastated because of the way that the miners are dealt with in that report. They are also devastated because in relation to two key things that are important to them, which is the compensation and the criminal prosecution, Falam has ignored a proposal to say he must recommend to government to compensate. He says he doesn't have that power. In relation to criminal prosecution, he says someone else will do it. The, the NPA will make recommendations and so on. But then they started working at Lonman. And probably three years or four years after they started working at Lonman, the criminal prosecution start. And when the criminal prosecution start, they must make a decision whether or not they will follow those criminal prosecutions. But even that comes at a cost. Um, so at Sibanye, if you don't, if you work every day in the year, you are guaranteed a bonus. But if you miss work, even if Sibanye or Lonmin at that time meets its target, you don't get that bonus. And again, the families say, we will go and follow these criminal prosecutions. Initially, the, the first criminal prosecution is about where one family member is, where he dies, just one. Of the 36 that we represent, just one. And all of them say, we'll go. They spend a week, they travel at times for four hours a day to go either to Mahigeng or to go to, um, I forget now the, the name of this, of the place, Emohuas, mm, to go to Emohuas. And during, during that time, right, um, even as we speak now, they have no hope of where the prosecutions for the big group, for the 34, but they accompany the one. Even now, they are accompanying the three. And in, in this spirit of resistance, the one thing that has been, has been clear to me, representing the family, is that the families want to be compensated, but more than anything, they want justice. That's why, and so I think people, when they think about what justice means, they feel like it's more important to put food on the table. But in the last 10 years, or the nine years that I've seen the families of Marikan, the monument is important to them because they are troubled by the fact that someone is, is trampling over the place where their loved one's blood was spilt. They are troubled about whether there's criminal prosecutions. Even if it will, it will cost them food on the table, they, are, they, are, they will put in that investment. Even now, when you, 
in the last year, there's been a lot of talk about, for instance, I think Kam Kamalita mentioned Reimagine SA. Uh, and she mentioned the approach of Sibanye in re repairing or in, in providing rep reparations to the victims of Marikan. In those conversations, even as, as recently as three days ago, the families are saying, why are the workers not here? If you are talking about repairing for the massacre, that people survived the massacre, why are they not in the room? Uh, they are saying, you can't talk to us. You can't just come and talk to Nzueli. You must talk to all 44 families. As, of, as recently as last year, they've been clear to say, Justice for Marikana doesn't mean justice for the 34 who were killed by police on the 16th. They are, they are saying it means justice for the 44 minors who died in that week. And all of that is said by people who, when they started off, right, had their loved ones killed by people who walked along, alongside them. And I'm saying this because the police and the NPA charged the other minors. These very same families fought in that very same commission to be given a voice. And amongst the things that they fought to say, they fought to say what the miners told them in the week of the massacre. They fought to, the police objected to them saying they killed their loved ones. The police objected to them giving testimony about the character of their loved ones. But 10 years later, they can stand now as 34 families or as 37 families who say justice for us is justice for the 44. That every life counts. Uh, even as government is, has continued with the narrative of you are to blame for the 10 lives or the 7 lives or the whole misremembering of what happened, they still pursue justice for everyone. And it is that that gives me hope. Because it tells me, sorry, I need some water. It tells me that even if you start with nothing, that even if you start at the back foot, even if the, your opponents see you as nothing. You are able, with consistency, to get a measure of justice. So in as much as 10 years must feel like, might feel like a long time without an apology, without criminal prosecutions, 10 years also means millions of rands have been spent on the education of the children of the minors. 10 years means that Spanye has, has been forced to, to, to do a land swap with Babu Bama Khale to actually build a monument on the land in, 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 in Ghana. 10 years means that Spania has been forced to consider that it, it has an obligation, not just in, 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 in Marikana, but also in the rural Eastern Cape. And those are the things that have done, that have happened because of people who, was, who were described as unsophisticated, uneducated, because of people who before never even imagined having a life or even having articulating anything outside of the four poles in their own years in the Royal Eastern Cape on Royal Lesotho. But those people have brought all of us here today. Because I think in as much as we've given them solidarity, if, we, if they'd sat down and said, I'm not interested in that, we wouldn't be able to be here. We wouldn't be able to remember this moment. Uh, and so I, I, I really hope that if you remember Marikana, if you think of Marikana, Think of that resistance. Think of that power. Not only the power that is articulated because of what the mine workers did, but how these 37 families have stood consistently fighting for justice in the last 10 years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nomazamo. Truly, I think it's a refreshing perspective to hear that we should think of the last 10 years as 10 years of resistance is an ongoing resistance. Uh, I want to invite Comrade Makanya to speak next because I think it would be good to, to jump off what you've just said now. Uh, but before I do, I have to make a, a small announcement. There is a white Audi with the number plate 
8876KHGP uh, who has an open window in their car. So if you drive a white Audi and you, B, or is that BB? That looks like an eight to me. BB76KHGP. If you drive a white Audi, one of your windows is open. Sorry to put you on the spot, but at a convenient moment to you, you might want to close that window. Um, so thank you, Comrade Makanya, for, for making it with us today. Uh, for context, Comrade Makanya has a night shift today um, and has driven all the way to be with us. So if you would like to share some of your reflections over the years uh, struggling in the platinum belts, we, we invite you to do so. Sanbana, Comrade. <laughs> okay, okay. Thanks for the time again. Ngu uh, Comrade Makanya from Gui Rustenbeck Mines. Uh, I want to share the most of struggle that we have, possibly most of Comrade they even away for the struggle of the mining industry per se. But I, I will just indicate a few things, guys. The mining industry never change, and they won't even change. Other to change better is become worse. Just simply remember our grandfather and fathers; they were going deeper, better. But as much we have to get product, we we still have to go deeper and deeper and deeper. So it won't be better. Either it will be still worse, the condition of employment uh, in the mining industry. So as employees, we still forced by the situation to unite. Normally, when you go in different sectors or people, they will tell you that, oh, mining employees, they die early. It's not like we want to go on the grave, our graveyard early, no. The thing is that, Showing to work every day does not mean we are well. So if we can tell that employee, employer how we're feeling, how we sick, how we feel, every day, they will definitely terminate our contract. So the real factor can tell you, Guti, if you check the history of mining, Abbas uh, mine per se, yes, it's normal that we can't make seven years, guys. So it's still hard, it's still hard, it's still difficult to us to survive on that working condition. It's just that we don't have a choice. We wake up every day, going to work, trying to put something on the table for those child, but we left them without parent in a very short space of time. Then, seriously, we are even concerned on what happening in the mining industry because our last hope that we have was not for government. Government have been failing us since Mandela time until today. We we're just hoping that impossibly AMCO will come and rescue us. So our deeply concern that we have on this day, we see the work relationship of AMCO and NUM in gold mine. And then that was the choice. Now they come in Rustenburg with same or similar mentality, we forewarn them. We will never like NUM with AMCO. In, in our mind, it tells us two things. It said, maybe, NUM Then, or it means if they want to work hand in hand with NUM. It means they start to tell us, now I'm going to be an NUM. So it's lento. If Bagwazu Puma with NUM, Sapuma with NUM, Singaba Seven say Tanda because was failing us. So if I'm going to force us to leave, I'm going to leave them either to go to join NUM because the reason is. ANC government never come at a stage to apologize on the at Marikane to the employees. NUM was involved on that killing, never come and apologize to NUM. So not even one person will wake up tomorrow and say, we have friendship with NUM because you like NUM. So that is a one deep concern that we want even to forewarn 
am ko about you titi yes we love them but if they choose to pave a way many times we saw comrade that we elect that we groom them tomorrow when banesis is cool as long as andres like they start to change and say now we want to go to parliament this is not a way to go to parliament our struggle our mandate our demand it won't be changed by individually people that we know exactly what we want the condition that we are working on 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 it currently is very we are even fear when we see those divisions because immediately you you try to divert employees to one organization per se we guess we start to get divided amongst ourselves and then the employer will then take advantage for that then it's one thing that also concerns us in, 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 the, in the working place. So as from today, we see on the commemoration people, they say we are celebrating 10 years. Is it a celebration? The death of the dead for people. So back from our mind also, we said, as people, we have to understand what is a commemoration to our mind. Because people, we find people on the street drunk and say to, that this is a, a conversation. And then we said, but people, they really understand how we feel, what happened, what is our concern in our life when it's come to, to, to that struggle. So community for today, it's like what uh, I want to guarantee employees. I want to, actually we should even leave the company. We, we should join another company. It's not like we can't join other company as uh, leaders or as former struggle of the 2012 workers some they choose to we said we can't exist the company it's not like we don't feel it but we do understand the we are the only hope it's long less it's by 12. we are the only <laughs> we are the only hope to change the situation because we monitor every movement that is happening on the mine uh, we even analyze that now now other sector or other what we call other stakeholders in the mining industry have been neutralized because when times goes, the struggle of the working class is always like a marathon. Other people, they will get tired, exhausted on the way. It's not like they are bad people. They try, it's just maybe they achieve their destiny. They can't do more. So we are still staying to say, when other people get exhausted, will then take it from there because the struggle of the working class will carry on and on and on. Not even one person possibly will win it. So, as employees, by my mind, askaga fun ugunegezela. City yes, that is fine. Our 34 because La Pesa Africa. If you are still alive, you will never be recognized. I will just make a simple example. Our government compensates the the 34 miners who died, I think it's in two years back, they compensate those, those, those widows, so I'm right. They compensate with 200, 200 million for those families who died only, not the survivors. Then the mine also, Sebanya, oh, it was long mill before. They also sign those uh, women, those uh, widows to the mine, but they never do anything to the survivors. Uh, when you come to Amco, Amco also build houses for Mambush and other comrades who died. But they never do anything for survivors. I can mention Om Zongkolo, Noma Matuanse, and other people. No. So we are living in this country where people, they cannot recognize you when you are still alive until you die. And then they see your veil in the, in, in the mind. So okay, we are concerned even to say those employees are not well recognized uh, as I'm a server, as I'm a hero, they always mention I'm a hero, I feel, who cannot even see that big house, this, that, that, that 200 million that we pay for them. And then uh, that is a shame, but we promise ourselves that we will fight for our right without being advertising uh, that, that pain. So for today, I feel like I'm a little bit later, I should be eight, but because of from savings, because I knock off and then I have to drive and come this side. I'm very angry at the same time. I'm very excited that you invite me in that meeting. I can't be long per se. There's too much on my mind, but for today, let me say I thank you all.
Thank you so much, Comrade Makanya. And we, we look forward to hearing everything else on your mind as the day progresses, because I'm sure you've got more beautiful thoughts to share. And the, the idea of the struggle of the working class as a marathon is a very powerful one. And I think now is the opportunity to, to invite Ronnie to, to share some, some insights as someone who's been around, been involved in this for, for a long time, having heard what Nomzamo has just said and what Makanya has just said. Uh, what do you Viva the spirit of Marikana, viva! Viva! Viva the eternal spirit of Comrade Mangosh, viva! Viva! And comrades, what this is all about is to rededicate ourselves to them, to their struggle, to their memory, and we pay homage to them, comrades. Evermore. Please allow me to sit. I'm a Madonna now. <laughs> and you see, comrades, I hope this is working. This is working. I want to tell you, uh, it's so inspiring to be amongst you all. The speakers and Zonke here, comrades. Inspiring and I pay tribute to the organizers. Inspiring because of this non-racism, the way this is covered here. I go to many meetings. I'm connected with I'm a Bonvui Communist Party. Some people don't like that. And the ANC, etc. And veterans and MK. We don't see this. But we see it here, comrades, who have organized it. You involve everybody. It's so evident. And comrades, I say this is a medalla now. You involve the youth. When I came into that door, I was so inspired when I saw this gathering and the youth. But I want to give you youth just a little word of advice. I came into the struggle in Sharpville in 19... 60, I was just over 20. Trevor, you're an old man now. You're older than 20. I was always the youngest, the lighty, in everything. It seemed to go on and on and on until comrades started dying. I never thought when I was young that I would be the oldest in the whole group. <laughs> And the energy starts going. I'm going to start sitting down. But the youth are vital comrades. The youth, young workers, young women, young men, the students, is vital that we involve people. So all power to the organization here. Comrades, you must continue with this. You must find a way, comrades, to carry on with what you're starting here today. Because this is one of the ways in which we can go forward and create the kind of force led by, and we hear it, the working class, and we see that. Why? It's so evident. We must get involved. We must see that the working class receives the support that those of us who are in universities, who are teachers, and so on. And it's wonderful the way we see the revolutionary intellectuals involved. It's a great example because it's the working class that has the power and the ability. And we saw that with Mambush. We saw that with the Marikana strikers. That's why the state, Amapuyis, and above all, the mining bosses wanted to punish them, teach them a lesson, intimidate every working person, every poor people in this poor people in this country to keep them down. So comrades, what I've got to say today, I'll try and <laughs> keep to the 10 minutes, comrade. Um, is first of all, I mentioned Sharpville. It shocked me to the core, and it impelled me to find the movement at that time and soon into the armed struggle. But I want to tell you, 
And Rihal Desai knows this. He came to interview me when I was living in Cape Town. That the Marikana butchery, the murder, the massacre, that's what it's all about. It shocked me even more. And I often have pondered, and it's not a question of which massacre is worse than the other. I was in the middle of a Bishu massacre. I know what happens in massacres and how they wait for the opportunity to fire and then try and blame it on the victims. But I've pondered, and I must tell you that I actually feel there's an element about the Marikana butchery that's actually even worse than Sharpville. And it can shock some people that one says that because the Boers' apartheid colonialism is so cruel. And yet we saw a massacre under ostensibly democratic government, democratic-led country post-94. And you know the point is that, yes, at Sharpville, those Boers with itchy trigger fingers were constantly waiting for opportunities to shoot down Yabantu. That's clear. Absolute cruelty. In their minds, formulated by the ideology of colonialism, racism, and so on. There's an element in Sharpel that's not premeditated. The people are protesting against the past laws at the Sharpel police station. So the police are rushed there to protect it against, in their minds, these howl this howling mob and so on. Actually, it wasn't such a howling mob there. A lot of the people went, went there out of curiosity, of support, etc. And at a certain point, somebody's nerve breaks and there's sh shooting and there's a whole fusillade. Yes, many of them just wanting to rain down murder and people shot in the back. Comrades, nobody was pursued behind rocks to be judicially murdered on the spot. The whole Marikana obscenity of your state and Amapoyis with the mining bosses behind them, premeditated murder. So it's not so much a question of Sharpville and Marikana. they both absolute foul murders. But really, what struck me, and you remember, Rihad, you came to me, I had immediately, unlike a lot of my comrades watching television and thinking, because the whole atmosphere produced by the bosses and government and the media was that the miners were anarchists and out for blood. My goodness. If you're in the struggle, you know the signal is if the bosses and the police are saying it, then the truth is the opposite. I had that mindset. So when I saw this butchery with the cameras behind Amapuyis, which made out that the miners are attacking them with their spears, attacking lines of police with automatic weaponry, of course you could see the miners were trying to get out of a trap. It was so obvious. But my goodness gracious, comrades, it took some time with investigative journalism and Greg Marinovich. But of course, again, it's not just the white guy or the reporter with the cameras, etc. It's always the people on the spot. Abba Sabenzi. And some of the black researchers from the universities, who took him to the spot behind the big copy. And there it became evident that the police, because they wanted vengeance, because two policemen had been killed 
in the week before, I guess. They wanted vengeance. They wanted blood. And they went there and they carried out those gruesome slaughters of half of the 34 who died. And of course, 70, 80 who were wounded. And we want justice for them today. Um, can't go into that fact. You've gone into it, comrades, and others have. I want to just move on with some other reflections. It's 10 years paying homage, and we're fighting the narrative for the truth, the dedication to the miners, the living ones, and the martyrs. But it's 150 years of the mining industry in South Africa, and that dreadful, murderous, exploitative, vampire-like heritage which we still live under and you work under, comrades. That's why we bow to you and you have to lead us. Cecil John Rhodes, butcher extraordinaire. He says, over a hundred years ago, when the governments of the day, because it wasn't a union, gold, diamonds had been discovered, the industry was going hell for leather in its exploitation and bloodsuckery. And they imposed the pull tax to enforce the migrant labor system, to break the Abantu, to break the people, Jikalele, not just South Africa, throughout Southern Africa, Malawi, Mozambique, all over, down with xenophobia, those miners helped to build this country. Let's always remember it in the fight against xenophobia, comrades, rearing its head. And the poll tax, the poll tax is imposed here in order to break the connection of Yabantu with the land. And they have to come and sell their labor in the gold mines and ultimately in the factories and, of course, on the farms, etc. Do you know what that buccaneer, that pirate, that murderer says? I read it the other day in preparation for today. He makes a statement. Why the poll tax? Well, you see, we've got to force this idle native population to give up the life of idleness and learn about the wonderful, the, the, the wonders of labor, the dignity. They must learn the dignity of labor. And at the same time, by the way, make the state more prosperous. That's this all road. And what does that give rise to? Migrant labor system? Pass laws. All the racist legislation and everything about the mining industry from the whole of this region that is so despicable and has broken over 150 years. How many lives? How many injuries? How much illness? How many families broken? Widows, children without fathers, etc. to grow the wealth of the bosses of South Africa and the imperialist order. That's what we have to bear in mind as well, what we have to change, and what Mambush and Marakana stood up against. And you roll on to this man, Froneman, Sibanya, Sibanya, <laughs> we are one. Doesn't it mean we are one? Yeah? Can you imagine Can the effrontery of Froneman and Sibanya with some of their black directors. We are one. Are you one with Froneman? No. Are we one with Froneman? Can labor, comrades, can labor be one with the capitalists? No. We can't. We've heard you, Trevor. We've heard the other comrades. And look at them. This is what we must oppose. This is why we have to ensure the legacy of Mambush and the Marikana martyrs and the miners like you of today. That's what the battle still is about. That's what we have to rededicate ourselves about. So let me also, if I have a little time, a woman, sorry to say that, a human being 
happened to be of that gender who had absolutely no knowledge of the police is selected by the president, Jacob Zuma, to lead the police. Ria Fiecha. Okay. It could have been a man. I'm not pointing out it was a woman. Please forgive me for starting off by saying the woman. But Ria Fiecha. What does Ria Fiecha say? As the dust settles, the blood is still warm. And she's saying, this is not time to point finger. <laughs> Why is it not time to point finger? I shouted at her at my television set in Cape Town. You remember, Rian, we talked about that. Not a time to point finger. Who does she mean? She means, in the first place, I'm a police. So she means herself in the line of command. She means those who give the orders, the ministers. She means the man on top, the president, who, by the way, 24 hours later, talk about the tail wagging the dog. Rhea Fierke says that it's not time to point fingers. Jacob Zuma now is on television 24 hours later. I couldn't believe it. He says, now is not the time to point fingers. <laughs> Can you imagine? Talk about the president taking the cue that way. And then, I'll have to be short here. Who do we point fingers at? Clearly, I've made the point, and I don't think it figured in her mind, the mining industry, and London, the whole mining industry. And of course, those who pulled the triggers, they have to be charged. Those who gave the orders in the police line of command, they have to be charged with murder. Those in government, ministers of minerals and energy, and police, and the person at the top, they have to be charged. In terms of the move forward in relation to this, they say, and I don't quite agree with the saying, it's a bit cynical, but you hear it, the more things change, the more they stay the same. There's some truth, some element, but it's cynical, but it can apply. So you get Rhodes, and then you get Froneman, of the new mining owner, and he says, actually, it's I think in 2019, that he won't be bullied by the miners. He won't be intimidated because they were calling for a thousand rand hike in salary. He's not going to be bullied. But he's saying, we are one. <laughs> and he earned that year, it's 300 million, maybe a bit more, in that year. And he couldn't budge on another 100,000 for the miners in their demands. So where is this nonsense and the lies that we must constantly expose and constantly be on the offensive and constantly support the miners of Maritana, of the whole industry, of this whole country? And yes, comrades, let me say this about Ria Fiecha. She had in mind herself, she had in mind the black police in the line of command and black faces in government. And it must remind us of Franz Fanon, who already back in 1951 and then in 1961 working with the Algerian struggle had published works, Black Skins, White Masks and the Wretched of the Earth. And we as ANC and MK and Party of the Communists, because most of my life was spent there, we said it could never happen here. That we would have in our country people who were black wearing a white mask. But we were too naive. And we should have paid more attention to Franz Fanon's work. Because his work is all about the question of how colonialism creates neo-colonialism. And in terms of independence, the creation of these new independent states, there's the emergence of a new political elite of black people that aspiring to be like whites 
and actually becoming the agents of the capitalist class, the imperialist capitalist international, and so on. In our country, the Oppenheimers, etc., and, and those abroad. Comrades have made reference to that. And that's what we need to understand in terms of challenging the state and understanding what is going on in our country and why we have to support the working people, the unemployed, the women, the young people of this country in changing the situation, as Comrade Trevor and others have said. So I'm coming to my end now, Comrade, because I just want to shift it in relation to the absolute wonder that took place at Wonder Corp and by those miners. They organized under the most difficult conditions where they were being murdered, where they were being sacked, where they were being intimidated, where their everyday life meant possible death. But to organize, to change things, meant taking your life into your own hands and having to depend on the collective. And when you read from some of the literature which has come forth and the research that's been undertaken, how the Marikana workers organized in the most outstanding manner, which has been the case with workers under capital for so many decades and intercenturies around the world. And they weren't people of books who were reading Marx and Lenin and the Paris Commune. But through their own experience, the working class comes to understand through its struggles what class struggle is about, what capitalism is about, and what the need for socialist society is about. And in the methods that they use, clandestine organization of committees, of working class power, of popular assembly on the mountain, popular assembly in the best tradition from the Paris Commune and so on. And I'll just come to that as I end. The popular assembly, the working class councils, the Soviets, Expressions from the Paris Commune of 1871 and the Russian Revolution of 1917 with the creation of what in Russian the term is Soviet, which simply means the council, the council of workers, of peasants, councils of youth and students and women. This is what these days we have to bear in mind. But Mambush and the Marikana Comrades, they created these councils where they discussed in secret how to oppose the bosses, how to have to deal with a union that was undermining them. And points you've already made about the union issue today, which the Paris Commune, and as Marx said, what emerges from the lessons, which is what I'll end on, comrade. So thanks for bearing with me. Because... We see the people's assembly on the mountain. We see the council of the workers and how potent that is. That's the example. That's the heritage. And in relation to the Paris Commune, how do they deal with workers' democracy, with representativity, with countering corruption in a very simple way? They say that in the commune, and they were armed, of course, because this was a result of the struggle against German invasion and then a class struggle within France. So they were armed. But they said the representatives will be chosen democratically through the councils, not in dark corners. The representatives would receive a wage not of those hundred thousands and so on, the wage of an ordinary worker. The representative would be recalled like that if he or she proved not to be carrying out 
the position of the council. They would be recalled. That's the basis. That's the principle. And in relation to whether it's the union, whether it's whatever council, whether it's the government that's created and the representatives, this should be and must be and is, of course, it's the creation of the working class in the commune and then later in terms of the first years of the Russian Revolution. And that's what I'm saying we need to bear in mind today. So, yes, the question arose, is it a day of celebration? Is it a day of mourning? Well, we can't say it's fully a day of celebration because there's so much that needs to be done and so much which you're dealing with in terms of the remuneration, the compensation, actually of 150 years, by the way, because the government of Mandela let the mining houses and the capitalists off the hook. That's when we should have put in our demands to the Oppenheimers and the mining bosses and the whole damn capitalist class of this country. And we missed that opportunity. And I'm guilty of that because I was there. We missed that golden opportunity. But we need now to reflect. Where were the errors? Where were the mistakes? And how do we go forward? So I started off by saying that actually what it is is a day of rededication, comrades. That's what the 10-year anniversary is, to rededicate to their lives, to pay honor to them, to ensure that what they did, that the narrative, the truth, is the one that prevails, not this in dreadful, poisonous way in which the mining bosses are trying to subvert what actually happened at Marikana. So call on me, please, when we go and we protest, we can't allow that bridge to rename anything other than to the memory of the Marikana strikers and Mambush and others. Well, those are my reflections. So thanks very much, comrades. Amantla! 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 Thank you so much, comrade Ronnie. Thank you so much, comrade Nomzamo. Thank you so much, comrade Makanya. I think that is a beautiful way to now enter a conversation. How do we collectively rededicate ourselves to the legacy of Marikana? There's a slogan, I think, in American labor history that goes, don't mourn, organize. How do we organize keeping the memory of those slain on the copies in heart and in mind? How do we move forward? How do we both acknowledge what we have achieved in the last 10 years, but then how do we strive for a society where this doesn't happen again? So I'm gonna go straight to questions uh, because I think the moment is ripe for other members of the audience to contribute to the conversation. So if you would like to speak, put your hand up, I'll recognize you and I'll try to give as many people an opportunity to speak. I'll do two rounds. So I see a hand over there, a hand over there and a hand over here. I'll take those three hands first and then a fourth hand over here. And a reminder that when you speak, give us your name, tell us who you are, and try to keep it as brief as you can. Thank you. Uh, my name is Phantom um, from Etembelihe, Pumagu Community Organizing Working Group. What I'd like to acknowledge the journalist. No must never recognize it, but Melena was about recognize. We need to recognize them. Without them, uh, if you can look uh, at the documentary, you could see the way So let's acknowledge them. credit. Even the the the, the our, our comrade um, Nomzamo, we should give them a credit. The other day, she spoke about with he, each and every uh, ama perpetrator, la ba enza ba na ma atene ba na ba advocate, ba ne timi abo. The only three of them. Can you imagine? Avanta ba itrebalo no nompagaji with state 
Father, no guti avanta vai travalo an state soanke. Because they are being supported by the state in Lavanda. They get the resources from the state in Mali to food. Iye to Lisbon yezayo. So we need guti nati do something. Even now, the youth, we need to do something. Sponi le ngi fizz must fall. Genza galin. I got Abazali, but parent took a decision to Machela Opushir instead of helping us Silele if his must fall. E youth in Amtaja, we need to take a stand that. We need to make a resolution with you. Our comrade is Katsavos Yaham, Tina Sitin. Thank you. Amanda comrades. Amanda comrades. All power. All power. Eh oh, libizo la kaki lisekho ke tswa sisonke revolutionary movement ko Orange Farm. Eh comrades, this thing it's very easy. It doesn't take the whole village or the whole country or le malebana yo to just say I am sorry. It doesn't take millions, seven and little now over two eight, to just say, I am sorry. It's not even a minute. Just that. It was going to make a huge difference. Just that. Without ama compensation, without uh, everything. Just to say, I am sorry. That was the first step. So for them, it's now 10 years. That word has not been said. I am sorry. So that simply means, they just don't want to say that those ways. It's okay. But now I've realized that even if now they can come and say we are sorry, how is that going to help? We, even the Labanda Bashonel, they don't need that sorry now. They are okay. They, 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 they've accepted what has happened. They don't need the sorry now. So now it's for us. We won't stop until justice has been saved. We won't stop until justice it's been said. We need to continue to talk. We need to continue to fight. Because the, the SAPS, the SAPS, it's, it's like a, I don't know what I can call the SAPS. But here in South Africa, the police is not for us. The police is there for the ministers, for the presidents, for the premiers, is, is there for that. Like uh, the other day, we were in Box Bay. Not, we didn't even have a spear because at Marikana, the, the workers, they had spears and we didn't have anything. We were just like this. But we had many police uh, trying to, to stop us from only talking. The police system of South Africa. How can they stop us from talking? While people die. And when we were there, it was like two weeks after uh, the people died in Orlando. Where were the police? Where are the police? Where are the police when our children are raped? Where are the police? There are no police. But when they could say, uh, the people are, are, are striking there, they say, uh, pay the grants, then you'll see the police. When uh, we, we go, like on, 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 on Wednesday, you will see the police. They will be visible. You won't miss even a single police. And they will come there fully armed. That is the police system of South Africa. Let us fight. Because if we stop talking, if we stop making noise, if we, we, we just keep quiet, then our children, I mean my children, at my age, when they get at the ages of 16, 17, then South Africa will be a no living land. We need to fight. Because now we are not fighting the Boers. Before it was apartheid, it is no more apartheid. We are fighting against our own people. The people who said, hey, we are going to protect you. We are going to save you. Uh, like Ramaphosa, for instance, if you watch the documentary, Ramaphosa was the one leading uh, NUM. He was the one protecting the miners and everything. He was leading them uh, the, the, for, 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 the, for the better. But then what happened? They took him in. They gave him shares. And then he just let go. He said, Maba fella bantu. Like he's doing it now. Whether we starve, whether we... he doesn't care. Let us not stop. We need to talk more. We need to be visible. Those t-shirts, they're the ones. Those t-shirts, we need to have them. The Marikana 
massacre needs to be known. It needs to be visible. Because in the locations, many people, they don't have the real story that what happened in Marigana. People need to know. People need to understand. Amanda. Amanda. Uh, my name is Ngobile Cleopatra Shezi. Uh, Comrade Crocs of the Marikana campaign, Solidarity campaign. I have a question that is directed to you. What happened to that campaign? Because I'm very disappointed that every now and then when it's August, that is when we start in organizing ourselves to plan for the commemoration of Marikana. Why can't the Marikana be every day? Why can't, while the lawyers fight inside the courtrooms, we fight outside the courtrooms? We used to do that, Rehat. Comrade Salim, what happened to that? Comrade Trevor, and almost everybody in the room <laughs> belonged to the, to the Marikana support campaign. Uh, let's start today. As com Uncle Rony said, uh, he noticed a youth. So let the Crocs teach the youth on how we were supporting workers with food, with everything while they were on strike. At some point, myself and Rihad, we were stopped not to enter Marikana. But because we are what we are, we entered the Marikana. Even now, if they can see us in Marikana, they will think that we are there to organize for NUMSA, of which that's not the case. So now we know the stand for us and the position for us to maintain the spirit of Marikana. Marikana is us. We are Marikana. And let that live with us. It must not only happen in Akas. I refuse on that comrade train. Let it be every day. And let's see all articles starting from today and onwards on the follow-ups of what has happened in Marikana. Mam Tumega, let's see more of those documentaries starting from today and onwards. Amanda. I'll take two more hands and then give the panelists an opportunity to engage. Let's see, okay, one, two, and then three at the back. Um, long live the spirit of Marikana. Long live the spirit of Marikana. Amanda. Amanda. Um, my question is um, you said uh, there are people who were, con were given jobs and everything. Okay, I understand they were 33. So what about those who were injured? Did they get something? Or did you even get sorry or anything? And then, um, as they said, uh, there's no any political party that came forward. Um, and also, including our president, Ramaphosa, didn't come forward. Were there any follow-ups or to any match or anything that went to the parliament to go and ask why? That is my question. Amanda. Amanda. Mandin Bully Sega and Vagwemin Lo Utetayo go Lizega boy. The Sugake Emaricane, Tunguma was Emaricana. And Yava Sia Kubekega, Sisenza Lesentanga, no Nesendibano. A Kagungo August in Jung Buma Mechil, Eti Ohale Lukuti, a Kubekeke, Pege Pambil. Kunga Tikango August, Bengo, Nagutinguang Emaricane. Zonke Zinyanga, a good thing, Wanga Maragan, a good two leggy Linga Maragan. Okay. 
So, in doing this, I know you. Oh, Mam and the last good about our band to the NPA by a will fit all any basabens and Labanda Batin. Go by another basabens, basabas, basabens, a lie, you NPA. Baketa I pay a machine because a babonagal got a batty basabens and Laband, basabens and Labanda Batin. Because in Dossi Funa, you go way forward. Good Dallas, the Tata, Sip Shungu, Sinanga Belinzulu, in the Bangel Basben and Belinzulu, Kungenga in Doba, Bapi Abanda Babesela, Ubulawa, Gabandu, Ekop and Dabi. Bahambanga Pandle, Baza E. Yokati, Baza E. is in Dresden Nand, Basel as Sophen, Babu Babete E. Babet Babeti Om Irimota, Babugeli DSTV, Babugele Indaba, Babugelu Kala, where 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 widows, Babu Babugele Ukala, where parents Abazali Abasole Gelaga Banduana and Dabi. Gubani, oh, I oh, I sell Ukbulawa Gabantu, Emarigan. Gubani o wa esele ukuti maguzu wene reiza waya ziobi yelela ikopi ikopi. Gubani o wa nigeza umteto ukuti pumane ni ambe ni oba valela uze ni zenba fumane bonge ni babulele bonge. Ngoba abasinda ya basenda nga ngeba katiko. Gubani lo mtu upi esenza ndoni lo mtu lo. Ngoba bako na bandu abakainga bandu bezkulu oka nyabandu abarich oko nzege isasa within eh Within 24 hours, Ubanji will loom to love. God will have us to be on TV, Beba Kaba, Beba Bulala, Paya, Entaben, Ekopi, Emarigane, Akonom, Yum to Banjwe. God will, in the end, the guy will be on, Ah, Baba, Be Shugunyezwa, Be Bulawa, Be Betwa, Inga, Baba, Says Jail. Si be on, Benga, Recognize, Wa, Aba, Sindayo, Entaben. Si abuza gengo kusingo mama basa marigana Ngo basi sapoteka kulu Otata abenza gelepa Singo mama sinombuzo ukuti Umbo umbo upi Uzuma upi Ngo bangabana bandi funeka bependule Urama posa upi Uria piecha upi Ngo ba waikona Iposi zelon mil Zipi Zenza ndoni. Because ngabandu aba strategize ukuthi magu. Magwanzeke yonke lande enze kapa. Ngubani umdo waka wabulawe ezitelele funilunge lo lake. Abulawe ezitelele endabeni. Ngubani wabulawe waka wabulawe ezitelele pa. Zange bafandela eze skolo. Zange, ba, be, zange babete bandu. Zange bafale skolo. Bazitelele endabeni befuna ilunge lo lapu. Batala nezanda sabe. Beli ndelo mkeshu kutazo bawoya. Amame liskalo sabu. Ndikala ukuti sisnomzam. Aba bandu aba. Njeng bandi batatu. Sikuazu ukuti sin support. Ukuti sibe lapa sibe, sibe zipe kapzin. Ukuze nibe na wamanda. Wakuti kufumaneka. Am, em, lemi kila mikuba. Aba bandu benze. Kwa pala ligazi. Kodwa kufuneka ndo iwai for wadu. Kutu wabenga hapa kwa ziko. Mabanga jubu si nebis. Bapile kuinda uye mana. Tina Gupsungu, every August is a Lila Gupsung. Nam Dinekas, Lam Dom Danaputu, I'm glad thirty four. Oh, what do you like Glandab as American? Ukona glad thirty four, Yapupa, Yopaglandab. Ella Kaz, Lakitaka Palake, Gubani Lowell to Bulay, Gubani Lowa to Bulum Dagaputuam, Guban Loa Bulalaband, Pika Gundabay as a copy of American. Sifuna lo mtu, akuzi ngeta ndu tete kote ngo kufunegi way forward Yo kuti mas, ababa ndu, yi action Yo ababa ndu mas, maba wana na aba Bevalo langa hapa kwa ziku Nengosi Amanda Amanda I'm um, just gonna add on Actually, what oh Mama Pastor Boy has just alluded. Um, I'm very uh, concerned about uh, e leadership here to Eba e Ama gatekeepers to actually um, um, navigate around this issue e, e, after 10 years. Because we see many people, many organizations coming to. Marigana questioning and and yeah, bakwa la babu akamabitso kore. Marigana, we did this and that. Go Marigana, mare. 
Harboni Sipe, Runa Barin Nanko Marigana. Um, they become gatekeepers, Kumarigana, um, in the name of, you know, doing something in, Mar in Marigana, whereas they are not doing anything. One understand. So it's been long overdue and Rabaiti. And I'm always saying, we cannot go out and clean other people's houses while our own houses are very dirty. So, Ari Patlen Ripati is saying, Lerona, Lidi Lida, Sohori, Rebata Ing. And then, are we really um, in a revolutionary um, spirit to assist whatever is happening in Marigana? Or we are going there to work and go back home and eat while Lerona is saying, I'm going to go to Zarun, Kalibo. And I want to give an opportunity to our panelists to engage with some of those points, provocations, and questions. I think Nomazam will somewhere specifically address you. Sure. I mean, I want to start somewhere because oh, Makanya he raised this issue. Uh, year recognition. I think government recognizes those who passed away. I want to be clear. Government doesn't recognize even those people. Kaban. Ungabina ilo confusion. Government doesn't recognize the widows. The widows did not get paid because government felt sorry for them. They got paid because they took government to court. And it still took three years for them to be paid. Yeah, exactly three years for them to receive that payment. And for some of them. So even now, the Mpumza family hasn't been paid. And we have to fight for them to be paid. So there's no recognition from government. But I was going to say just in terms of just giving the specifics. So government has paid a uh, 200 million kulumangai. They haven't paid 200 million yet to, to even all the victims together. Government paid, the first time they paid 3.8 million to one family, and then they paid 71 million to 34 families. So to the families of the deceased that were killed, government paid in total 75 million. And then government paid 104 million to the arrested minors the 200 plus that we are talking about. And that's why then there's a figure of 200 million. It's adding those two figures together. But I, I, I'm concerned that we must know that there isn't a recognition. Even Isbanyi, probably if the families were to look at who's acting, the families might feel that Isbanyi and Lomin recognizes them more because they see what they are doing in their lives. Government, they've not gotten that kind of, of recognition. The reason, for instance, someone raised the issue of the apology, which has been outstanding for so long. Should we even still care about it? We care about the apology because we want non-repetition. We want a guarantee of non-repetition. We want our government to acknowledge that it made, it made a, if it was a mistake, a mistake. Of course, for us, they must recognize the massacred workers. But they can say we've made a mistake. We would then we want to ask them, if you made a mistake, how are you going to make sure you don't do it again? That's why there must be an apology. That's why there must be an official recognition by government of what happened. And that's why there must be a public holiday. Um, on the issue of resources, uh, Comrade Ufandam was raising this, and, and Mom and I asked the same thing. So when I was speaking about the three lawyers, Comrade Fandam, I was speaking about the NPA. The NPA has three lawyers who are working on the Maracana case. The Maracana case has, I think, at least from what they've explained to us, four aspects. There was the issue of Tereskhalala where police officers got acquitted. It's over, it's done. There's the issue of the five, the, the five murders of the 13th uh, and people were arrested then. There's an ongoing trial where there are 93 witnesses. And then there is the case of those who killed and we saw on TV in scene one and then those who were, who were, who were assassinated in, 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 in scene two. And those three prosecutors are working on all four of those cases. They're working on all four of those cases, plus other big cases, including the Ahmad Timol inquest, for instance. One of them is working on that. It means the resources that are available to ensure justice for the 37 families is very, very limited. That's why you can EPNPA, IEECO. The NPA is response to us because we, that team, when, we, when they are in court, we are with them. The families are with them. They trust that they are, they are the unwanted stepchildren of the NPA because they don't have the support of the NPA's leadership to run those cases. 
Because if you remember, the NPA did charge the 279 workers of killing the 34 in the beginning. So they know that they don't have the support of the NPA leadership. So of course, uh, and we are grateful for Ikao, because Ikao did this. On, 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 on the 15th, they, 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 had a, 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 um, they had a protest outside the NPA to tell the NPA, you must put resources on Marikan. We want justice for Marikan. Um, on just it's cutting Kaban. Um, the one thing, the reason why we want events to continue happening about Marikana in August, every month, every year, is because there are people who are sitting on top of information. Uh, the, the police expect for the police in the commission said the executive knew. And we want the people that are gonna give us the receipts, right? We want the evidence. We want to know who made a phone call to who, beyond what we already have. We want the, so we want those people not to have peace, wherever they are. That, that meeting that happened on the 15th of August, the people that were sitting in that meeting, they must tell us who said what, who gave what instruction, why they decided the next day is did they come what may, even if it's bloodshed. And that's why these events must continue to happen. And we are grateful, this is clear. See, I also plan before you can't see the American support campaign. I was in East London on Thursday morning. Uh, the Daily Dispatch has a picture of crosses on the N2 in Cambridge. I don't know if you know that place, in outside Cambridge. And it's because of events that were being organized in East London about the, about the, uh, for, for the commemoration of Marikan. And we're asking the people who are here, if you are able to, please arrange an event any time of the year. In fact, in June of this year, the Marikana families were in Durban, in, the, in Abatali's office. And, and the next day they had a march to the Human Rights Commission. But they say the brutality of policing in South Africa is not just an issue of 2012. It's an issue of 1976, and it's an issue of every day. <laughs> okay, comrade. We beg Let me say it. We used to discuss this issue, the Shaville massacre or the apartheid government, as uh, employees. At some stage, Ronnie, I used to say, it, you know, apartheid government was better than the current government because that government were not put in power by us, and they were shooting us. On their sense, they were right. But what is wrong with this government? We vote for them, we put them in power, and then they turn and kill us again. So between the two, I end up saying, not one supposed to die, but how can I put you in power and then you come and kill the same person who put you in power? That kind of government that we have. If you go down on the mining, I'm almost 16 years experience working on the mine, guys. I never see any woman going to the retirement and say, I reach 60 years in mining and then I go home. I'm trying to tell you or to indicate the position of the harmful or of the cases that affect us underground that they can't even make 60 years on the mine. They die early than us. So those silica dust, those explosives that we all, always breathe on it, it minimizes our lifespan. And then we know that if you want to influence anything now in this country, you must touch mining or you must come to, to Marikane. It seems like it's just a, pop it's a popularity place where people, like I said, oh, we go to Marikane now, people, they will have to know you. But the real fact is that even in Marikane, employees themselves, they stuck on something when I can say it is a democratic oppression because they choose AMCO. But now some of them, they are even scared to move away from AMCO after the killings that are happening, that is a fact. After the killings that are happening now and then, I can mention no combat by I can mention Otato Keiza. I can mention the guy that possibly he could, he could be here today, Obaba O Obele. We all know he used to be there. But 
for those comrades that they were killed there. They were killed because they were raising voice and said, but we are not recognized. We are not even expecting such treatment from that. There are many killings that are happening and then we have been hiding it. And then we, we seems like we are stuck and said, if I can raise up my hands, I may possibly be killed also. I can be the next one. So the situation would never been better. As Joba Umama Ashagoti, people they were raised and said we do that and do that in Marikane. But Abanda Batlale Marikane, they still staying on the shakes. That mountain of fella kona makomrate. Even today, I got fence or about clonishwe. Today, we talk about Lusele kona ingo. Mabani, we talk about So not even one respect that place per se. We were expecting to by these ten years, maybe in Lela E Marikane would be a tar road to show that he agule andab. But even today, not even one person particular. We do understand the reducing lapis. South Africa, he kept charging the Maposa. Not even one judge is as authorized the Maposa are killed to cause another human zondo on the top. Gabo. Okay, thanks. So, comrades, the uh, Boers from colonial times to apartheid were frightened of the people, dead scared. The government today and the ruling party are dead scared. But there is a change. There is a change. So when we say upi ama poyes, and we're asking, will the police come and serve us and not the bosses or the gangsters and the rapists? There is a possibility today. Call it reformism, and I'll come to the revolutionary answer. But actually, we do have possibility. That's why we're here. That's why we're discussing what to do about Marikana. That's why we can go to the courts as frustrating as delays can be. So what can we do at present? And then we'll come briefly, I'll mention the, uh, the, the Paris Commune and that point. But yes, it's the mobilization, the organization with working class power from the streets and the communities and the points of labor to people's power in the broader sense of United Front. The more organized we are, the more they will jump. The more Cyril will jump and ministers will jump and I'm a police. If we weak, then they'll ride roughshod over us. It's the case in any society where there's some aspects of space and mobility in the Gramsci sense of movement and so on. The openings, there are the openings. And the more we organize our strength, the people's strength, and particularly working class strength, the more we will make the gains and the more they will be quick to jump. Apologies and so on, justice, for those who have died and the widows, etc., which is why on day of dedication like this, we should, comrades, have a resolution here, yeah, as small as this might be, but important, to demand the justice for the widows and the Marikana dead and the memorial aspects and spread that wherever we can. It must become part of the mass movement of our people. So under governments of this kind, everywhere in the world, where there's possibilities of reform, we must utilize that and build up our forces with the aim, obviously, in the end, if we're talking about the working class, of a democratic working class-led society. So you see the final point going back to example of Paris Commune or any revolution from Russia of 1917, China, Vietnam, Cuba, and so on, before bureaucracy's heavy hand comes in to control, control etc., that the power of the working class, through its ways of organization, the popular assemblies, the working class assemblies, the councils, the Soviets, that the Paris Commune, gave us as an example. That's where the revolutionary tide comes in. And when we have a socialist revolution, 
which is the ultimate objective. That's where the Paris Commune principles of who represents you, the recall factor, the question of state officials, the army, the police, to, they then serve the working class democracy, which of course we don't have in a partial bourgeois democracy, national uh, democracies of the kind that we have in the world at present. And that's what should be our goal, the future goal, what we work towards. But because we don't have it, and on the way to it, we must see the openings in terms of the possibilities that I've referred to. And that's what gives us hope and strength and the will to organize and mobilize in the way that we've been discussing in, in, in the symposia. Thank you. Amanda. Aware too. Thanks, comrades. And thank you so much to our panelists. I think, unfortunately, we will have to close it there. And if you want an opportunity to engage with them, I recommend that as you get tea, as you get coffee, approach them. Everyone here must talk to each other. Everyone here must rebuild the connections.